It's going well. Thank you for having me on. Uh, busy. I just made a, you know, a homemade pizza, got the kids to bed, um, prepped for tomorrow morning. It is Autism Awareness Month. I, I feel like uh, I'm, I'm sporting the shirt, you know, embrace whatever, whatever this says. What is it? Hold on to your uniqueness. So it's an odd to, okay, gotcha. Uh, interesting about this. I would have never been caught dead in an, like a, like a autism shirt, a down syndrome shirt, like one, you know, and I, I was like, even when I found out, I mean, I taught and I'm like, you know, you know, whatever, we don't need to do that. And then even when I had my kid, my first child, my 11 year old, he uh, started school and they're like, oh, we're ordering t-shirts. And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to buy one and it's going to sit in my, my closet. Here I am. I've got like a whole closet full that I actually wear because uh, I realized that um, when we go out to spread autism awareness, that's what I say. Like when, cause my son's nonverbal, but he's like the loudest noisiest nonverbal child ever. So he will, um, you know, vocal, you know, his vocals will get a little high and stuff. So people end up realizing like he's on the spectrum, but it helps that, um, if I'm wearing this shirt, a lot of times people will ask me and I had to become like, I didn't want, again, I didn't want to wear the shirt. I didn't want to be an advocate. I was an advocate for 20 years for other people's children. I was going to devote this time to my children. I wasn't going to be like, you know, part-time mommy, full-time, you know, can't save the world. Uh, uh, but God has a sense of humor because, uh, when I walked into my son's school today, absolutely the voice of the voiceless, like, you know, and it's, I can't believe that I started teaching when I graduated uh, in 95. <laughs> um, I started working with kids like part time at a preschool. And then when I started teaching, uh, you know, full time, I would always I ended up with all the children that had special needs that may have had um, disciplinary issues because we were a typical school. This was a very, you know, in an affluent area, parents were paying a lot of money for their children to come to the school. So it was an amazing school, but it was typically developing, you know, really no disability, you know, but that changed because it, I would get the children, you know, the uh, administration would talk with me and say, look, we have this child that's on the spectrum, you know are you okay with him trying out your classroom? And I'm like, absolutely. I have never said no. I'm ne I've never said no to a child. So, um, so yeah, it started from there. So I remember having my first autistic student like in 90, I want to say 99, 2000. Where are we today? And we have not made that much progress because the emphasis, like parents, a lot of it is parents not knowing, they're not educated, uh, they're ignorant. And I'm not saying that to be like as a slight, like they just don't know. And what I was up against, the little pre-K teacher, when I would say, hey, look, I just did this assessment. And obviously I can't say, I think there's something wrong with your child, but I do have assessments that we would do. And Obviously, you know, it's, it's in a way that you can see there's red flags. And so I would do these assessments and be like, Hey, look, you know, I think we need to talk further. So, and I, I would hope that, and it's easier, I'll give two examples. So my son, um, who is 11 now, I knew after he had the MMR, so he was about, uh, it was, I don't know, 14, 15, 16 months, 18 months, around that time. Um, 
he showed no signs. He did not show any like visible signs right away. Um, he was progressing. He was doing all the, you know, meet, meeting every mark, if not more. He was verbal. The comprehension was there. Then he had the MMR and he lost it almost instantly. So then that was, you know, uh, crying a lot. Um, a lot of children flap. They flap their arms. They rock. So my daughter, who is eight, almost nine, she's the fun autist. Uh, she is verbal, too smart for her own good. Um, but the anxiety, the anxiety is always going to be like that there in terms of autism. But it is a spectrum and it, it, it all is different. But she rocked so much when she was, as soon as she could start sitting up, whereas my son didn't do that. So you have to look for things like if they, if your child is going like this, if they're rocking back and forth, a lot of it is like they're sensory seeking. So tippy toe walking. And I'm not saying any of these things is not an automatic, but it is like, Hey, let me keep track, write it down. Be like, I first saw this because I did when I first saw him like walking on his tippy toes, um, you know, the, the certain vocals, the certain motions, the movement. Um, so he had his, he has his stimming, it's stimming. So they're stimming and we all stim. And what I don't like is that a lot of, um, schools and like a lot of ABA therapists, they try to like stop the stimming. So whatever you try to do to like soothe and like to calm down and that may be chewing gum, that may be like, you know, clicking a pen, any of those things. Like that's why these fidget things are like so popular now, like the fidget spinners and things like that, because that is a way for someone to try to soothe. So there are coping mechanisms. Um, I used to like shake my leg. Um, so everyone does something. It's just, if you've got aut like a disability, like autism, it's going to be like amplified. It's going to be like so much more. So instead of just like rocking your leg back and forth, your whole body might be rocking, you know? So we all do it. And what's upsetting is that people, uh, professionals, parents, they're like, and I'm, I do it too, but I don't shame her, like my daughter, because sometimes she's rocking that couch like she's going to break it. I'm like, slow down. It's okay to rock. And if she's standing, she'll like, you know, she'll back and forth on her feet, but she doesn't do it all the time. She does it when she's trying to process something or she's nervous, if she's excited. So I'll give her the language and I'll say, you know, I think, you know, what's going on? How's your brain? Like what's going, what's your thought process? So I taught her at an early age, whereas like when I was younger, uh, in my generations and I'm sure yours, we didn't really talk about our feelings a lot. Like but like if we were to kind of uh rebuttal, like have a rebuttal, like if like talk back, like it would look like we were talking back to our parents. Whereas, you know, when you ask your child, Oh, are you okay? You know, no, I'm her. Like I'm a, I'm a kid. No, I'm mad. You make me so mad. If I were to have said that to my parents, the way, like, you know, be, like how passionate a lot of kids do are now, but it's a good thing. Do I think that some children take it to the extreme? Absolutely. But I had to internalize everything and I had a hard time. Like when you have a child, you see yourself in that child. So you're like, crap, like that's, that's just a mini version of me. And so, you know, and I most likely am on the spectrum, but again, I was born in 77. I did have a speech delay. I did not speak until I was about five or six. I was in speech uh, therapy. I was so like introverted that I didn't want to speak to adults until I was like a teenager. I would talk to my peers. I would talk to my peers.
So when you first started podcasting, did you feel like it was like a did you dread or like, oh, I don't want to do this, but I have to do this? Like, did you, were you excited to do it or were, was there a part of you that was reserved? Like, oh, I got to be like social with this person. I have to have this. Ex- yeah. Me too. Do you think I overly love doing these things? I don't. I do this for you guys when you ask. Um, Cause I swore I would never be on podcasts, but That's a story for another time, but because of the advocating and and seeing like, you know, I'm going to fly that flag. I'm going to be that voice for people. And obviously if it's where 2024 and I can't believe how there are still children like my son who are nonverbal and I'm sure you've seen it. I, and I, I, if I say it now, maybe people will realize when they're out in the wild, like if you're out in public and you see someone who you may think is on the spectrum and they may be severe autistic, look and see if they're using their words. Are they, are they verbal? And if they're not, do they have a device? I meant to grab my son's uh, talk, uh, his AAC device. So it's assisted technology. So, I mean, Just think of it like there's programs on on here. So Proloco, you can use your iPad. You can go into the App Store, Proloco, Touch Chat. Now, they're expensive. And I feel like every child, it's a civil right that they should be able to communicate. Like it's 2024. And how I equate like children, when I see children, adults too, I still see adults who cannot effectively communicate because they don't have the resources. And we shouldn't we shouldn't have that problem anymore. So I struggled in school. My mom made sure to she didn't want me to in the public school. I went to Catholic private school. I was in private therapy. Um and I think because of the stigma, she knew I was most likely autistic. My mom was very much ahead of her time. Like she, and I'm not all of my successes, whatever that is, is because of my mom and my dad. And if I had different parents, I wouldn't be who I am today. And I don't even, and I say this regularly throughout the years, I would say, I don't even, I don't know where I would be today. I don't know if I would be, um, you know, in society being productive I should have been a statistic, be it like jail, um, the loony bin, um, depression, anxiety, like a psych issue. Like, and I'm not, and again, I'm not seeing like, you know, mental health is a thing. I'm, I'm, I'm crazy. We all know this, but like, um, where I, I had to like, do away with the stigma. And even though I was getting early intervention for my children, my husband was in denial for both of, for both of them. And I remember him texting his mom and I wasn't being nosy, but he always has like those, his phones, he always has like the biggest phone and he had it in the holder. And my son was about, he was before two. Now try, getting a diagnosis before two is very, very early and unheard of unless you're someone like me or it's severe enough. But a lot of times children are not um, diagnosed until pre-K, kinder, first. But even then, there's children that are that probably should be diagnosed right now and they're in middle school, high school, they're adults because A, the resources, the parents are in denial, the parents don't know what to do, they're scared, they they feel like, you know, if I if I put words like I think my child's autistic, um they make it real. It's like, you know, they're they're just like I don't want to deal with it. So with absolutely. So yeah. And, and, and I'm not saying like it, it, it was kind of like uncomfortable. I would say embarrassing. I'll own that shit. Like, even though I taught 
in an environment that I had students, it's different when you have your own child with disabilities and you, you go out into, you know, into society and the community. And, um, I remember going to, um, going into Walmart and it was in a rural area. And this was like eight years ago. And the cashier said to me, is he retarded or is he special needs? And I was like, internally, because I, I almost did, but I had to realize because he was sitting, he was, you know, in the cart and I didn't want him to see me upset, but I also me being that teacher and being that advocate, even before I was a mom and before I became a mom, I'm like, it's a teachable moment. I don't know how many times I've used the term teachable moment because, you know, okay, obviously she's, she was elderly. So back then, you know, that's what they would refer, I guess, anyone that like may have had a disability. So I said, um, he is autistic. Um, but he doesn't have intellectual disabilities because that's the kinder term. We don't really use, I know we have friends that use the word retarded all the time, but it really is like intellectual disabilities. Like, you know, so, I mean, it is what it is. It's a word, you know, I, I, I'm not, you know, I try not to use it. I try to use it in context, you know, But, um, so I explained to her. And so from that point on, I think if my mom, when I was trying to tell my mom, cause I did get to the car and when I got him situated, I did cry. Cause I was like, this is what it's going to be like from here on out. Like I was like, you know, Because it's different. If you don't fit into like this little box, if you know, if you can't sit still, like just think about like our manners, like you were, uh, we were taught manners, like table manners. Uh, you can't be loud when you're out at a restaurant. You, you have to, sit. don't put your, don't put your elbows on the table. Like there's, there's a certain way that you have to act and polite society. Well, here you have, you know, for so long, for decades, um, you are starting to see, and it's not that all of a sudden we're seeing an uptick in autism and all these other disabilities, because I mean, there's, that's a whole other, that's a whole deep dive. But the thing is access to, uh, like professionals that know, autism or any of the ranging um, disabilities and being able to spot, being able to do checklists. And, you know, it has gotten better, but I remember saying to my child's pediatrician, what good are these um, questionnaires that you make us fill out if you're not gonna like look at them and be like, oh yeah, because I remember at a certain point, um, like he's not meeting this, he's not meeting that. And I was like, you know, and I don't know if it's like these, I even said, I remember saying, is it that you guys get a kickback for like doing like these questionnaires just so you know that you can say that you did it, but you're not looking at the data that we're giving you and going back to me being the little pre-K teacher and saying, Hey, look, I think we need to look over these results and maybe see like if we need to do some further testing. And almost every single time the parents would look at me and say, mostly the moms. Oh yeah. I talked about it with their pediatrician and they said to wait. So Amit, who are you going to listen to? The pre-K teacher or the doctor who's got all the degrees? Honestly, no, many people, maybe now, because we're changing that, because
day in and day out. Mm -hmm. And there's certain things like you, you do, uh, we were, you know, taught to do a specific type of observation and, uh, you don't, you, it's objective. It's not like subjective. So you're writing down like a meat sitting, a meat's rocking, a meat's, you know, you things like that, like so-and-so stood up, he put whatever toy in a basket. Now that child could do that five to 10 times. That's a repetitive behavior. That would be something or so-and-so lined up all the cars, but not the trucks and they have to have everything. So when you line things up, when you say like, if there's things that you can look for, anything that you, if you look at those milestones and you look at those questionnaires that the, that everyone has and you're like, and, and this is the thing. I never lied on those questionnaires. So many parents, because they don't want to address, be it they don't see it, or they they're like, no, we're good, we're good. We don't we don't need to check that off. I know he's going to be okay. He's going to get this task. He's going to get. How is that helping your child? It's not. So, um, you have to be your child. You are your child's best advocate. You are their first advocate, even if they don't have special needs. Just take the disability out of it. Your child is your child. I got so enraged. I kept this handy because I wanted to show you. Y'all, we're going to be all over the place, so buckle up. So I wanted to change pediatricians. And I... I Believe me, if someone wants to prove... I got a breakup letter from my, uh, children's pediatrician so many years ago, because I refused to vaccinate my daughter because after my son had the MMR, I'm not anti-vax. I am kind of now, but I wasn't then. Uh, but when you see a child developing and I have the knowledge that I have, and I did what I did, for so many years. And when you see like, we're good, we're good, we're good. And then he has the MMR, there was vax damage. And the MMR is mumps, measles, and rubella. Those are three separate in one. They cluster that with like a lot of vaccinations because of cost efficiency. So, and one thing that one of the many things that I wanted to try to get done before we had our talk was I wanted to see the data on how much of a kickback incentives do the pediatricians get from big pharma. So from the farm, the farm, the reps that come to, you always see them. If you're at the, the doctors, you always see those reps coming in with their wheeling in all their products. And you're like, you know, the doctors are getting something for this. So what are they getting in terms of, um, how are they being compensated for vaccines, vaccinating children? So my son was in the hospital because he had an injury to his leg. And so, um, the doctor that he, that was overlooking his care, amazing. I loved him. And if I'm saying that, like, And the nurses had great things to say about him. And so he even said, you know, he saw, he saw my son the whole time that he was in the hospital. And he even said, you know, I thanked him for everything. And he's like, Hey, he made, he made sure to let me know where he was. He's like, if you guys need anything, I'll, you know, I'm there. So I was like, okay. So last weekend I went on their website and I'm like, let me pull up the policies and stuff. This isn't new. This has been going on. It's just now they're making it like, I don't care what you think. Uh, I don't care that you're a parent to your child. I'm going to be so authoritarian that I'm going to make you sign a vaccination policy that states uh, this pediatrician's office is strictly a vaccine only practice. We only accept patients that intend to be vaccinated. Talk about losing my shit. I was like, the reason why we see so many disabilities, especially autism, yes, it's better, um, you know, um, 
observations and um, assessments, but it's also we're seeing such a rise in it because of what's in the vaccinations, um, what's in the food, what's in our our products that we use. It's everywhere. Everyone, if people want to say I'm a conspiracy theorist, go for it. But until you walk this and you see it and you're like, how does this happen? And you realize we saw COVID. So what this means is, are we going to get you nuked? No, we can talk about COVID now, right? We could talk about. So, well, thank you for that because that was kind of rhetorical because I will. But like, so I, um, I was like, huh, interesting. They don't tell you exactly like, do you have, uh, do they have a vaccination? Because there are some um, doctors that you can follow like a schedule. Like you can kind of space out the vaccinations. You don't have to have like them exactly how the CDC tells you to have them, how they recommend it. So this means that every single vaccination that is all of a sudden created, they won't see your child. So you're literally signing your child's life away into the hands. They're supposed to be healers, not harm. They're not supposed to do harm. And I feel like doing this harms because all children, we see children who are getting the COVID vaccination. Why? There's a whole country above us that was literally told you can't go to the grocery store. Your children can't go to school. And I'm sure, I think maybe in California as well, that you have to be vaccinated. So children, you were literally, they were literally kind of like, you know, kind of sort of putting a gun to your head being like, okay, if you want your child to be educated, or if you want your child to be able to go play in the playground and go into a, into the grocery store, you have to vaccinate your child. So these, this policy, and I was going to call and confirm, but I already know because this isn't the first time I'm seeing it. This is the first one I'm seeing in my area because we're not very, you know, liberal here, but many offices are getting to be like that. Now, going back to my breakup letter from the other pediatrician, she got pissed because I refused to have the MMR for my daughter. And she tried to make me seem stupid. She, I remember when the folder would open up, there would be post-its. Oh, mom says that autism is caused from vaccinations. And I'm like, until you bitches can tell me exactly why, because we don't know why. We don't know why. There's no clear cut, right? So, I mean, I'm sure they, we know, but like no one is coming out with white papers that says, this is what causes autism. Like what causes, like I had colon cancer at a very young age. Should I have had colon cancer? No. One of our friends might be diagnosed with colon cancer in the near future. Should he? He's younger than me. Should he? No. Why? What is it? Is it the environment? Yes. Is it possibly the Diet Coke addiction that he and I both have? Possibly. No, but things like, you know, things that are in everything that we have consumed ever since we were young. Even if you're trying to eat clean, how do we know that? Those crops are really organic and really are clean. When we see chemtrails up in the sky, how how are we supposed to stay healthy ourselves when we are literally being, you know, manipulated? Our health is being manipulated. So I should not have had colon cancer as early and that were like three, four years ago almost that I had that I was diagnosed. Stage three. I could have died and I'm not being like dramatic, but because I was so focused on my children, I was missing my doctor appointments. And that's the other thing that I've realized that I need to be here for them. So I have to be as healthy as I possibly can. So like my, cause uh, I have an, uh, like I was always anemic. So I would go see my hematologist, which is also oncology, like they're together. So I've seen him since I was pregnant with my first 
child. And so I like for 11, over 11 years. So when I went into his office after not, I had missed so many appointments because I should have had like an iron infusion a couple of times and my hair was falling out and it was bad. Like I needed a blood transfusion when I finally did decide to go to my, to see him, I had to go right to the hospital for a blood transfusion. He was even shocked. He's like, I don't think you have, you know, I don't think it's anything cancer related, but you'll, you know, go to the, we're going to have you go have a colonoscopy. And, and of course I knew as soon as I woke up because everyone was getting to leave and the nurse was like, so the doctor's going to talk to you in the office. And I was like, okay, okay. We already know then, but we are, yeah, yeah, I did, but I just, so, uh, I had bleeding. Um, I was so tired. My heart was racing because my levels were so low that I could have died even before, like because of the the whole lack of blood in my system. But um, they, uh, yeah, I was just ignoring it. It got to the point where I remember the the day before I went to that appointment, we were going to go to my appointment and then we were heading down to South Florida for a wedding. We rarely ever get to go away. And we were looking forward to this. Our friends were getting married. but And I just thought I was going for just a checkup. Like, you know, I'm going to pop in. He's going to tell me I need iron. I'll schedule that for, you know, the following week after we get back from the weekend. And when he told me that I needed a blood transfusion, the doctor, I was like, uh, when? And he's like, uh, now? And I was like, oh, because you know me, I'm always this way. And I'm like, well, I'm supposed to be going out of town. Like right after this, he's like, uh, no. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, this is unbelievable. And I'm like, okay. So he walks up huffy and puffy. Cause I know he, he, I know he truly cares. And, uh, so he tells the, uh, the office chick who didn't know me because I hadn't ever been to the new office because I hadn't been there in like two or three years. And, He's like, can you call over to the hospital and see if you can get Shannon in right now? Because apparently traveling is more important, you know, than living. And I was like, goodness gracious, so gloomy. Dr. Dr. Doom. She just looked at him like, I can't believe, she was like, I can't believe he said that. I'm like, it's cool. We're good. I go, he cares. It's fine. And she's like, and I'm like, it's fine. So yeah. So, um, but Uh, Yeah, I did experience that night before when I was packing, I had to stop what I was doing because my heart was racing so much. I felt like I was going to pass out and I just, I was so tired. I was so flipping tired all the time. And I just chalked it up to, my son doesn't sleep right. Like the other, yesterday I was up, night before he was up at 2 a.m., uh, today he slept till like four thirty, but it's very erratic his sleep schedule, which is another, which is another, you know, indication that you might have a child on the spectrum. They they can't like shut their brains off. They have a hard time, you know, settling down. He has to, you know, take sleep meds, uh, melatonin on a regular basis. Like it's a whole thing. So there are things like if you. Parents know, even though they're trying like not to to see it, they're going to see, especially if they're in social settings with like play dates with other children that may be typically developing and you see a child who may parallel play. So that's like, you know, you have here, there you are there, you know, you're there, I'm next to you. We're not engaging. We're playing. We're kind of next to each other, but there's no interaction back and forth. So if you see a child who, you know, wants to play with one specific toy, you know, my son does not overly love toys. He was never really a toy kid. He's more of like a, like a sensory. So the, the therapy, bouncy balls, uh, trampoline, water play, a lot, all of that, that's his jam. So, but if you see like, And it's okay to ask other parents like, hey, I just had one of my friends who she's like me. 
she's an advocate, she's a social worker, and it was a question um, relating to her granddaughter. But I get it because when you're so close to a situation, like it's easy for me to be like spectator, like I'm looking as an observer, not my children. But I knew, I mean, I knew, but even though I was like second guessing myself, like, no, I'm just, you know, being paranoid, but it it was creeping. It just kept creeping. And I, and I would say to my husband, I think we need to get him, you know, diagnosed, like we need to get him tested. And we, FSU, uh, lost their funding for evaluation. So we had to travel an hour and a half. And this is the problem. If you don't have the means for transportation, if you don't have the means for, you know, the, 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 like the funds, you don't have that access. If you, if you have those going against you, many times children are going to slip through the cracks. So, but it's not their parents' fault, but that's why when I started seeing like children out in, you know, the community and I'm like, they're just roaming around. There's no purpose. They're not, they're not, you know, engaging with people. And a lot of them are very standoffish and I'm not saying to force, but you have to try and encourage your children. You have to push them. And I actually, I have, I had a couple of books that, um, So Temple, she's, um, she's autistic. She's a speaker. She, uh, you would think she's very odd because she's very unique, but, um, this book is called the loving push and it's how you, you need to like, you know, push your kid out of their comfort zone. And, um, and I'm still, you know, I don't read for pleasure anymore. Like I like when you talk about the books that you read, like when you say, because I can't tell you the last time I read a book that wasn't like for work, like, look, dude, I'm like, I feel like I'm back in college. I'm back like, you know, teaching, but this autism and education, the way I see it again, doctor, like she's a doctor. She has, she's such a trailblazer, but she did it her way. And, you know, she does speaking, like she does public speaking and she does all of that. And, but she tells people, you know, don't force your kids to, you know, do things that may seem harmful and and all that, but you do have to push them. I know that I have to be careful with my son because he elopes. And that's another thing. If you have a child that like runs and there's like no safety, like they're not aware of their surrounding, like, you know, when they're two, when they're three, you're teaching them that there's a car, you have to stop, look both ways. When that's not clicking and they're five, six, seven, and you're like, oh my God, this kid just almost got hit or this kid just wandered off into the water. Like that, that's, that's a big clue that there might be something wrong. So, um, but yeah, there were signs when I was, you know, not feeling well, I was just, trying to deal with what I was dealing with. And again, I was putting myself like usual, moms always put themselves last, but I had to fight for my son. There's in every state, and I meant to look this up for everyone, but I'm pretty sure every state kind of has like an early intervention program. And I know that like back in the day, people would have the stigma, like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I even in the beginning when he was first diagnosed, I was like, oh, I got this. We're not going to need to like involve um, the government because that's what, you know, this program, it's, you know, the state, it's, it's a government program. And even before I became a full fledged libertarian, I was like, I'm good. We don't want, I mean, that's why my mom didn't put me in public education, like, she was like, you know, I'm going to private, do private therapies and I'm going to pay for her to go to private school and I will get the tutors. And then my mom would have to reteach me everything when I got home because I was not understanding anything. My comprehension was absolutely horrible. That's why I am. S- Mm-mm. You.
Because back then, if I would have gone to a public school, you would have had, you know, those that were severely, um, you know, with intellectual disabilities, uh, severely autistic, uh, severely disabled. Everyone was getting clumped in one room. Whereas now they're being, you know, they're kind of like, this is the autistic, you know, this is the autism classroom. This is the the classroom that, you know, they may need special feeding tubes and they're in wheelchairs and they need, you know, so, which is amazing. But yet where your needs were more like physical, like you needed that support, mentally and you know cognitively you you weren't you you probably should not have been in special needs you should probably not have been in a special needs classroom because nowadays i mean didn't you say it was at high school that you were in like regular classes or were you still Which, and now you go, going back to how you're like the stigma, like why, why is it still taboo? Like, why are we still seeing this issue? And it's that, it's the fact that we used to be all clumped in one classroom. If you, you know, if you were to have a disability and, and my son's school is different because it's a special needs school, which back so many years ago when I thought we were going to be able to do this without assistance from like the early intervention and like the public education aspect of it. Um, I'm like, I'll, I'll pay for private therapy, just like my mom's model. I would just tweak it a bit, but it got to the point where I'm like, it got to the point where I even was like, this is bigger than me. Like I'm going to do him a disservice by trying to do it all on my own and I'm not doing him any good by doing this. So I got him enrolled, you know, like he was like, you know, two in the early intervention, early it, we it's called early steps here. Um, but every state usually has one from zero to three. And then when they're three, they can go into the public school. Cause technically you don't usually go into the public school until kindergarten, but they've kind of like made it a little lax where they've added pre-K, which I've got my own opinions on doing pre-K and, and all that. But in terms of special education, so zero to three. And so he was seeing uh, an OT, a PT, and a speech therapist, speech language pathologist. And then um, he aged out of that. And then he started in a school in our district. It was supposed to be an autistic classroom. It was a regular campus, but there are classes that have, you know, but I don't want to, I don't want to forget about this part, going back to the stigma and why have we not seen such an integration? And it's because of that. It's, you know, you probably should not have been put in that classroom. You should have been in with your peers that is of your, you know, the same level, in terms of academics, just because you have, you know, your, your health issue, uh, peers that you would, you know, friends and, and cause I'm sure you did not have a lot in common with the students that. And so that might, yeah. And you might, you might've been like, a little rebel by the time that you got to high school and so extroverted if you were with social settings that were with kids and, and teenagers your own age, your peers. <laughs> mm-hmm.
And I say integration is key. Let's get insert. There's okay. There's like, you know, the rule, the exception, you know, everything, you know, it's on a, it's on an individual basis. But so for my son, he does well where he is right now. He was, he will, he would have not thrived in a typical classroom setting in a typical classroom. My daughter is in technically an autism class, but it's like a typical regular class, you know, she's the smarty pants. She's actually in a, in a, in a class that has like third to fifth grade. So she's the youngest one, but it's actually helped her. Whereas last year she was one of the older ones and there was a lot of younger kids and it wasn't, I even said, I'm like, we're going to try one more year of this. And if it doesn't pan out, we're going to, we're going to do homeschool. My children are in the schools that they're in because they want to be and not because they have to be. And a lot of parents are like enslaved to their district. And so my son was going to the one school when he turned three, we started, he started at this one school and I was, you know, very hands-on. I was the mom that helped, you know, volunteered. What do you need for the classroom? And I thought we had a good rapport, the teacher and I, I found out that she was making him leave the classroom to go to the sensory room with his para. And he was supposed to be with children just like him, but because the vice principal's son was in that class and what used to trigger him was loud noises and whatever. And they were close friends, the teacher and the vice principal. And that teacher looked at that, that child as like her like grandson. So already there, there's a bias. So my son was being removed from his learning environment, not learning social skills because he was like the only one. So I was like pissed. So I was like, okay, um, we need to do better. What are we going to do different? Like he can't just keep, you know, being kicked out of the classroom. So oh yeah, you know, don't worry. It was still happening. And then the teacher started to resent me and started to have a problem with me. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but this is my kid. So I had a standoff. I, uh, there was a, there was a point where I was like, he's not coming back to class because I remember one of the paras messaging me and say is, and she asked, Hey, it was either. And I have the message saved. Um, this was years ago. Uh, do you think you can bring Luke in later or, um, can he stay home because there was like staffing issues? And I'm like, they would have never asked a typical parent that. And it got to the point where I was like, okay, because, and Wilkins, my husband would get upset with me. Like, no, that's not okay. Like that, you know, there was a lot of those kind of situations and me still having like that teacher hat and trying to bring awareness for all of the children. Um, and not just focusing on my son. I was like, um, okay, well, I remember I kept him home and it was going on like almost a week. And so they were like, Oh, is Luke, is Luke okay? Is he going to come back to school? And I'm like, Nope. He's not coming back until you guys get, um, there was a specific ABA therapist. And I know some people might be triggered when I say ABA because technically ABA was very rigorous. It was very rigid. It was very like, you know, it was, it, it could be harsh, but I made sure that I found a company, uh, you know, that I really like trusted and that I could align with, like with philosophy. So I remember he, I met this ABA therapist, you know, analyst, and I said to them, you guys obviously need more resources and training, and you obviously don't know what you're doing with children like my son. So you need more help. So he's not coming back to school until this person comes to your school so you can figure it out. And so... I said, I will pull him out. And I, and see, the thing is, I hadn't talked to the principal because I was trying, me being a teacher again, 
I used to hate and it wasn't very often because I was almost perfect. I didn't have parents that hated me. I didn't have parents that like, you know, I'm going to go tattle on you. I respected them if they would just come to me and be like, hey, look, I have this issue or what's going on with this. Like if they, if their kid wasn't like painting enough, because if like there was a child that didn't want to paint and they wanted to be in blocks and build and Typically, that was the boys. They didn't want to paint. They didn't want to do the arts and crafts that their moms wanted to put on their fridge. They didn't see the value of them building. And I would take pictures. I'm like, this is what they're doing instead of wanting to paint. And I feel like this is amazing. But I would go into the block center and I would take watercolors. I would go to the child. I wouldn't force a child to come, even like circle time, like I wouldn't force a child to sit at the circle meeting time like, you know, hey, if you want to come over here, this is what we're going to do. And you would try to like build up that trust and get them to be enticed enough to want to join your activity. So that was my mentality. Like you can always connect with a child. There were students that I never vibed with, but I would have to and, and you would be like, oh my God, this child, like we're butting heads, like it, this is not going to work. And I remember someone saying, I was at a seminar once and they're like, look for something that you have in common with that child. There's going to be an interest or something that you can connect with. And once I looked at it from that, then you can scaffold and you can find like you guys can grow together and you realize like, oh, you know, like my daughter is hilarious. She's going to be funnier than me. I didn't think that that would be possible, but this child is so funny um, that her two teachers ago, they were butting heads and we were all having so many issues and so many behavioral issues. And, and I'm like, why can't this teacher just find a way to connect with her? Use the strengths. Like my child, you know, she likes to be a helper. She likes to be that leader. She likes to be funny. It wasn't until the end of the freaking year that her teacher realized, oh my gosh, she's so funny. She makes us laugh all the time. You know, I let her tell jokes. Yeah, you could have led with that in the beginning of the school year. Like you're setting kids up to fail. And that's what pisses me off. Like I will go to bat for children. If you're a dumb adult, I have very little patience for you. I will, I, I can't, I can't like the subtitles on my face. You will know how I feel if they, the words do not come out of my mouth. How, like if you're a dumbass and you're just being, you know, but in terms of a child, we have to set them up to succeed and early childhood is so very important. So, you know, I did not get paid a lot being a pre-K teacher. I would do it for free. I volunteer. I would teach for free. I literally did, at, you know, but it's so very important. But the emphasis on early childhood education and development is overlooked. They're so like, you know, children have to to be a certain way. They have to do this. And, and we're all totally different learners. I did not test well. Uh-uh. I was getting toilet paper. Seriously? Hurry up. She's getting toilet paper. My daughter, who should be asleep, I'm talking about you. Are you funny? Yes. Are you funnier than mommy? Yes, I am. (laughs) Okay, go get your toilet paper. She is. But, you know, you use those, those characteristics, those, you know, all of those things that make up a child, like if you see their, their, you know, the potential, the qualities, uh, their, their strengths and don't focus so much on the the weaknesses. So, um, it didn't go well at that school. He got bounced around to another school, uh, another class. But by that time I was already like, the, the line was already drawn in the sand. We were on, we were on, we were enemies, like, and I, I got her demoted and I say demoted and this pisses me off because she was teaching like kindergarten, first, second grade. And they moved her the following year to pre-K. So their response to her not knowing how to engage with, you know, the age group that she was with, 
which is still considered early childhood. FYI, early childhood is technically from zero to second grade. Second grade. And where are we in terms of like the public school model? We're putting children in front of computers in pre-K and kindergarten. They're not hands-on. They're not learning with their hands. We did. We, I never used dittos. I didn't use runoffs, worksheets, whatever we're calling them these days, dittos. I just dated myself. But like we were hands on, brains on learning. And that's how everyone learns best. And again, that's a whole other rabbit hole and why my opinion on why we're so half ass backwards in this in in our educational system where Junior high, you start to see band, you start to see, you know, everyone can learn instruments, everyone can um, perform in a theater type setting. We're not seeing that where we should see it in early childhood education. You can learn the most. So these children, if you're in a regular public school model, they are not learning a whole child approach. And we're doing them a disservice and they're testing on a computer. They're working on a computer. They're failing up. I guess apparently now, even if they fail a grade, they they still get to move on. How is that okay? But that's not your fault. That's not your fault. You, you were at a disservice. Like they did there were so many, whatever, like it is what it is. You're amazing. Now is I'm amazing. Now I, my hope is you don't want your children to suffer and to go through the hardships that you went through. So that's why I had to say to my, I had to advocate for my children and I had to say, this is not working out because these teachers would legit say, Oh no, he's doing great. This is what needs to, we need to do this. We need to like remove him from the room. No, no. But a normal normie parent would be like, okay, okay, whatever you say until it's too late. So we moved him to the only other elementary school in a classroom that was for autistic children. And I told him he is not to be removed from the classroom. We had this whole, like I had a meeting with the principal and with the head of special education of the district. And I was in there for two hours. I went in with file folders. I went in with documentation, all of that. So they were floored because they were getting a story from the teacher. Like, I just, I don't know. I guess I just can't, I can't give her what she, her expectations are too high. And because when I looked at them and I laid it all out, I'm like, you might be getting a story from her. But I'm telling you right now that my background is this. I know what I'm talking about. I know my child and I know what should be going on and it's not going on. And so they had they had to agree with me and they were apologizing and I'm like, this is not okay. So go to the other school. They all know who I am. And, uh, you know, there's that mom. Uh, so I find out that they were taking him out of the classroom during nap time. Again, the majority of them are autistic. They don't nap. They don't sleep. They're, they sleep very rarely. They can function on two to three hours of sleep. Not well, but they do. So again, you're setting children up to fail by implementing like, oh, you have to stay on your mat. You have to, you have to take a nap. I mean, if they're not going to sleep, they're not going to sleep. So, uh, a para hit him at that school. My child was struck by a para and how I didn't lose my shit. Then I mean, it, God I, I, is all I'm going to say. And I think because at that time I was still of the mind that, oh, I'm a teacher. I wasn't teaching, but if I want to go back to teaching, I, I can't have a, a record. I, I shouldn't get arrested. So, so I was like, I was, I explained, you know, I'm not happy with this. And I, I think he lasted another week because it was just, it was bad. I was trying, I, I was still trying to advocate for every child. And at a certain point, my husband's like, you need to stop and just focus on Luke. 
And I'm like, I know, but it kind of, it's full circle now because he, when I told him that we needed to get, you know, both of our children diagnosed, like, um, assessed, he was in denial. I remember him saying to his mom, Shannon thinks he's autistic. We're on our way to get him, um, tested. I don't think he's autistic. I just think he's, um, delayed. That's, I saw the message, the text message and I'm like, okay. So I pick up my phone and I text his mom and cause she's in South Florida. She's Puerto Rican. She's like this, you know, little Latin mom. That's like, you know, you tell her something and she's going to be like, okay, fine. You know, everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be fine. I don't roll like that. I'm like, no, I'm not going to like sugarcoat something. I want, I don't want any surprises for anyone, you know, when it comes to be like, and I'm like, Hey, look, I texted her, look, your grandson is 99.99999% on the spectrum. I know this. I know he's going to be diagnosed on the spectrum where severity. I can't tell you. I said, Oh, and your son's delayed (laughs) because my husband was like, Oh, he's not autistic. He's just delayed. So I'm like, your grandson's autistic and your son's delayed (laughs) because he was in denial. So my daughter, that one hit harder for him. And I'm like, I got to be the mean one, man. I'm like, I got to be that mean, like, oh, I know that this is wrong. We have to, you know, address this. And he goes, he literally said this to me. He goes, you're looking for a problem. When I realized, because my daughter rocked. So ever since she could sit up, I knew. So six months and she didn't have the MMR. So Luke was about 15 to 18 months. We started to see the decline, but he didn't like have those stimming, those coping because everyone's different. But with her, the wrists and the rocking and I'm like, crap. So I wanted to get a a jump on it because I knew that we did not have uh, enough like, you know, um, professionals in this area to observe and to assess and the resources. So I'm like, we need to like jump on this. So we, the FSU got their funding. So we were able to get her into the program, but there's a wait list. There's a wait list everywhere. There's a wait list in California. There's a wait list everywhere. Every state has a wait list. I'm reading on Facebook and all these message groups that parents have been waiting two years, three years for their child to just be assessed and diagnosed. Because if you don't have the means to privately have an assessment done, you have, you are, you know, a slave to our government. So, um, if we had more professionals, that would be different. If it was more attainable and accessible, it would be, it wouldn't be so, so bad, whatever. It wouldn't be this bad. So, um, So I actually just visited a, um, it's, it's like a, it's a spacious like ranch and, um, my son will most likely be going there. So we're going to leave the public school model, uh, his school, he'll be there like maybe another year. And he's been there since he was like four and a half. And so, you know, it's, it's his community. He loves it, but the model is just not right for him. He needs to be working. He needs to be outside. He needs to be working with his hands. So they have gardening. They've got all, you know, they've got art. They've got, you know, if they're, whatever their interests are. And like how a Votech is. And I said to the superintendent, because he and I are, have become <laughs> fast friends uh, of the district. I'm like, these children are not going to benefit from like the academics portion, like the math, the sciences, if it's not applied, if they're not using their senses. In order for someone to learn the best that they can, all senses should be used. So, and I was explaining this to my daughter because she said something, I don't know how we got on it about, um, 
she was saying something about learning about something from a book. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, learning, uh, I used an apple as an example. So like one of the, um, activities that I would do with my, my pre kers um, instead of just reading about a book, we read about a book and usually in like a, a regular school, you're just reading books, you're online, they're doing their curriculum all on the computer. They're not engaging. They're not working with their hands. They're not, there's no critical thinking. There's like, oh, you know, and I remember when I, when I taught part-time at one of the schools here, so my son could go to um, preschool uh, before he was officially diagnosed, he would go part-time. I would work part-time. There technically wasn't room for him, but because they really wanted me to teach, they made room for him. So it was worth it to me to work. So he could, even though I was like not making that much money and the the gas, what we were, you know, it didn't matter to me. So, um, I did one of the activities I did with my, at that time I, I had two and three year olds. So, uh, we were talking about apples. I brought in all the different types of apples and I sat them down on the table. So they were able to observe them. They were able to talk about them. And then we did a big chart like apples and, you know, what's your favorite color. So they're learning, you know, you're learning colors. Uh, there's math involved. All of the areas, all of the domains are happening in something like observing an apple. Let's investigate an apple. Uh, What's in an apple? Do you know what's in an apple? Like I know that like these are things that children should be presented with, the type of learning and lessons, and it's not happening. Like uh, they're learning about an apple from a runoff sheet, like or in a book. And it's just like, they need to be able, even if they know what an apple is, you're getting, they have their peers. So they're bouncing ideas off of each other. So it's kind of like a, a think tank. Like they're all sitting there. They're like, Hey, oh yeah, I didn't know that. Did you know this? So they're, they're socializing They're you know, the comprehension is, is improving. Um, and all of the different skills. So like when we would be done, like looking at the apples, I would say, okay, I'm going to cut the apple. What do you think's inside of it? So they would say, you know, some of them would say there's seeds in there. There's a core there's, you know, and so, okay, yeah, there are seeds in there. Um, how many seeds do you think are in that apple? And, um, so that got to like doing like a guesstimation. So they saw their worth. Like I would write their name. They would, if they were able to write their name, if they were able to write the number, you know, and we worked up to that. Obviously, if someone, if, you know, a lot of kids didn't have that fine motor ability, I would do it. And so we would talk about it and we would see, oh, wow, you know, let's see how many seeds were in that apple. So, you know, kids would throw those numbers out like seven, a hundred. And, you know, you would, and then you would hear like another child say a hundred, that's too many. Now the child that said a hundred might not understood that concept of too many because it's a small apple. These are the instances that are like, this is how real life and the teachable moments and the real, the critical thinking, there's none of that going on in public school. I mean, for the most part, I know, I see it. So so I remember one of the moms who was also uh, working at that school, the last day that we were there, she cried. And I'm like, why are you crying? She goes, you were the best teacher. And I'm just so sad because, you know, we, we don't have you anymore. And, and cause I took pictures of the children and I, they didn't have words with their, um, artwork. And that was, I couldn't understand like when I walked into that preschool and it happens in a lot of preschools, not the original one that I worked at, but, um, you would walk into preschools and you would see like all of the same art in every child's art should be different. Like there's, it shouldn't, there should be some kind of like, you know, like spin, like their, their own like uniqueness to it. And so, um, I saw that like they had artwork up, but there were no words. And I'm like, what is going on here? So I started, um, I got sentence strips, but you don't even need to do that. You can, you know, write on the paper, um, ask, I would always ask, 
you know, the kids, can I write your name on your paper? Or do you want to write your name on your paper front or back? When you're asking children those kind of questions, you're letting them have some ownership and some like value, like you're respecting their space, you're respecting their things. And those are skills that are important in an early childhood education and like are built on throughout the educational process, their path. What we see in our educational system is that these children don't have access to instruments, art, uh, PE was taken away for the longest time. That's kind of come back. So they get physical education, but those kind of things that like high school, uh, we see like what high schoolers get should be in early childhood education. They should be getting the instruments. And yes, some schools might, but it should be like every child should have access to these kind of things, the STEM programs, things like that. So, um, but when you see that you graduate high school, you could either go to college, university, or you can go to a t- technical college, a, vo- a vo- tech college, like, you know, and a lot of those, a lot of those careers were like, there was a stigma for that up until just recently. So Oh, you want to be a plumber? Why do you want to be a plumber? Ew. You want to be an electrician? Oh, why? Why don't you go to college? Like I was, when I went to high school, they were trying to get us all to go to like these fancy universities. And I'm like, that's not my jam. I'm not, that's not going to happen for me. So I, and I fell into teaching by accident. Like I was going to the college that my mom worked at. She goes, do one semester. If you don't like it, it was free because she worked there and I'm like, fine, whatever, I'll do it. Um, and I was looking at the Art Institute of Fort Lauderdale because I actually wanted to go into music production in terms of I wanted to do like sound and mixing. I wanted to go on tour. I wanted to do that. But I also knew at an early age that I wanted to have kids and I'm a girl and I can't leave town as easily as a guy. I'm sorry, but it is what it is. I'm not like, you know, women can do anything that guys, whatever. No. So I knew then that I wanted, if I didn't want kids, I probably would have pursued that, but I wanted children. So I knew. So I was going to, I needed to find something that I, I could do that wasn't going to take my whole time away. Like when you see professional moms, I would have students that would get to um the school at 6 30 in the morning and then they were there till 5 30 6 6 30 at night so what time have you spent with your children and these were children these were parents that were professionals uh had money they were spending over a thousand dollars back in the late 90s for tuition so but it was just sad because you know some people think that if you come from a low economical family, if you're poor, um, you're not going to do well in school or you're going to have uh, problems more at home. It's not the case. It happens. And that's, I think, what changed the, you know, the whole magnet schools, the um, school choice. But, you know, going back to integrating, like, I wish that a child like my my son could be in a, a typically developing like a regular gen ed class, but for him it doesn't work. But for the majority of of children with disabilities, they should they should be integrated. There should they should be mainstreamed. That's what they call it, mainstreamed. Whatever. They usually have an IEP, but you know they can go into a gen ed class with their IEP, and you know so they're with their peers, and that's how it should be. And I'm hoping that with more, um, you know, awareness, and not just the month of April that it's oh it's autism awareness. I I keep saying that until like Black History Month, I understand why we have it, but. Until we can get to a point where we don't need it, we shouldn't have to highlight, like, you know, the differences and stuff. But, like, in terms of disability, like, you know, there's a month for everything now. Like, you know, Down syndrome was last month. Autism is this month. So, you know, 
all of the disabilities have a month and that's great, you know, but a lot of these organizations, they're just doing it for a profit. They're not putting that money back into. So like, uh, like, uh, autism, what's that one autism, the main one autism speaks the lighted up blue. Like it's a whole controversial thing. I mean, like if you were to go like, It's entertaining when I see um, moms that have autistic children that uh, they, they, they don't see things the same way. And I'm like, who are the ones with the real disability, the children or the parents? Because I, so uh, my mom showed me a shirt that was at a store and it said, um, I love someone with autism. Now hear me out. I'm like, yeah, mom, that's great. I said, but here's the thing. That is very divisive. That's like a, uh, I can't believe you're wearing that because there are those that think of the philosophy that um, my son doesn't have autism. My son is autistic. So I tend to say my son is autistic. My daughter is autistic. Not that they have autism because a lot of times people feel like that is um, like there's something seriously wrong with them. Yes, there's a disability, but it's like, like it's like there's a stigma, whereas it's a part of them, but it's not all of them is where I, I look at it. So I don't care. I don't care how you refer. And I've seen autistic adults that say I like to be referred as I have autism or I am autistic. So I feel like it's like kind of like a pronoun thing, which I'm not knocking that, but it's kind of like a, what do you prefer? Like, do you have a preference? I don't want to like, um, disrespect you, things like that. So, you know, looking at these parents and arguing about, you know, the organizations. Now I'm not going to sit there and like argue online about autism speaks because I don't agree with it because if autism speaks was so great, you, you wouldn't have to have me doing what I have to be doing right now in terms of advocating. So we just had a national advocate, a well-known advocate from Texas, rolled into my, um, not where my children go, but my County. And, um, I feel like, do you know who Jim Cantori is from the weather channel? No. Okay. So if you, so if we have hurricane season or any kind of like, whoa, like issue with weather, especially like primarily hurricanes, If you see the reporter, and in general, if you see a reporter going into your town, you're like, oh shit, like something's wrong. Riots, like if you see a a heavy presence of like, you know, you're like, oh shit, what's going on? So in terms of like Jim Cantore, he's like, you know, he's on the Weather Channel. There's memes made after him. It's hilarious because they're like, you know, if you see him in your your city, you're, you're scared. I literally said to people who didn't know who this, um, and I wish I would have known that she was coming. I didn't realize that she was here until um, a couple of days after because the same, she was advocating for a student at the first school that I was at, that my, that my son was at. And the mom was a teacher, is a teacher. So she's a teacher, but she's a mom first and she's an advocate first. And so a lot of teachers who have children with special needs kind of toe the line. They're not going to like rock the boat. They're not going to be like, you need to do this for my child or else. So she was like, her child was hard of hearing deaf and she went without services for a long time. So she was obviously like me. I'm sure she was trying to bring up her concerns and they were the same principal, the same superintendent, the same superintendent that's trying to be reelected. And I won't let him be reelected. I have been using my mouth so much that I, everyone's pushing me to, uh, run for the school board and I'll do it just to shit all over them. 
so that's my district. That's the kids district. So I'm, I've been very vocal with them, but now I'm probably going to try to start going to this County where, um, because here we are eight years later and the same school, the same principal, the same superintendent, the lack of resources, nothing has changed. So until I see positive changes that, you know, autism speaks and there's like a shit ton of them. And it, it goes for like the animal ones and any organization. Come on. It's a grift. It's, you know, it's God, you're making me all hot. God, fuck. You know they know. They have. They have cures for uh, healthy health. Going back to this vaccination form, which we're not going to that doctor. And, and I'm not, please, if anyone's watching, you know what's best for your child. If you believe that you want to get whatever vaccination, by all means, do it. But if there's some vaccinations that you don't want and but they're forcing your hand, find another doctor. And I'll give you uh, the name of the doctor. I think it's Dr. Paul Thomas. And he got canceled before it was cool to be canceled during COVID. Just like I got I got I broke I got broken up with from the doctor. She sent me a letter and everything. I wanted to frame it. And she legit said, because you will not vaccinate. And this was like, like Lana's almost nine. I, I want to say she was like three or four. So I was way cool before you all wanted to be anti-vaxxers. But going back, you know, the woulda, shoulda, couldas, I probably wouldn't have vaccinated my son. I probably wouldn't vaccinate my daughter. Uh, but when there's a measles outbreak, do I worry? Like, shit, what if she gets it? I do. But I also then see, like, I don't look at the hysterical doctors that are like the the fear, like, oh, you have to be vaccinated or your child's going to die from the measles and X amount of cases every year and X amount of children die. And well, yeah, but what about all the vax injured and all the things that are so, the, the medicine that's supposed to be helping them? So there are also doctors that say, if your child ends up with the measles, it's not like a death sentence. There are ways, just like the chicken pox, I just found out that I need to look into this before I speak more about it, but the shingles shot, there's something about the shingle shot and um, causing, it, it's not good. It's supposed to be preventative, just like all of them. Like they're causing us to be sick. Healthy children do not make money. Healthy adults, like we need to be sick. If we were all healthy, what? I mean, they're trying to take. No. And, you know, I've known pharmaceutical reps who hated their jobs, who left their jobs because of I couldn't do that. Like, how do you how do you go to sleep at night knowing that you're part of the the destruction, the problem. Like I'm trying to be a part of the solution. I'm trying to help where I can. I'm not trying to harm. So that's why, you know, wh wherever I can, but I, I didn't want to be excited because when I saw like this, um, advocate, you know, showed up and I was like, you all, and I know you're not on Facebook, but I shit all over them. I make sure those posts are public. I know that someone at the district is on Shannon watch and now probably at the other district. I give zero fucks. I used to care. I don't care. I will smile in my mugshot. If it comes to my children, I will smile in my mugshot. I am 45 and a half. I am arrest free so far. My daughter asked me, she's like, have you ever been arrested? And I'm like, no. And she asked if my husband, I'm like, no. 
I told her, I said, but I said, no, Nanny used to tell me that if we were to ever, I have two brothers, if you ever get arrested, do not call me to bail you out. And I'm thinking, we were scared of that lady. We're still kind of scared of that lady. And we would just like sit in jail. We would not want to want to deal with that lady. But she'd bail out these grandkids. Like you should see, it's amazing what happens when they go from parents to grandparents. Like every excuse imaginable as to why the bad behaviors. Oh, maybe it's because of this. You know, she's tired or he's, you know, where was this with me? Like, but- I said to my mom, uh, remember when you said that if I ever got arrested, you're not going to bail me out? I'm like, if I get arrested at this point from here on out, it's going to be because I have to do what I have to do in terms of advocating and and for my kids. And you're going to have to bail my ass out. She's, she's like, okay. But yeah, but I said to my daughter, no, but that's not off the table. I might end up being, you know, arrested. But, you know, you look at like, I, I would suggest like, you know, going back to like red flags and stuff. Parents, like being organized is key for like almost anything in your life. And right now it's like, you know, I'm like, I'm not very organized, you know, when I end up having to do what I'm, I've been doing because I have, I've had to be on the news. Uh, and this mom ended up on the same news channel that I was on. So here you had me on twice. Um, And then not even like the first one was November, the other one was December. um, And then she was just on last week. And I, I was like, Hey guys, you know, here we, we have this County, that County, like when, when are we going to wake up and, and, and I keep shaming parents. I'm like, I'll shame the teachers and the professionals, but parents have to speak up too. And I get that they don't feel like they know what they're doing, do you think I know what I'm doing all the time? I don't know what I'm doing all the time, but be organized. Doing something is better than not doing anything. So, and, you know, trying, you know how like they say, like when your babies are like, you're introducing your toddlers to food and they may not like a specific food. So you, you know, give it some time, but then you try it again a little bit later. Like that's what you need to do in terms of like, um, skills, uh, coping, like things that you can work on with your child. Like this didn't work. This therapy didn't work. Or I say that I will try to do anything for my children once, even if I don't agree with it, as long as it doesn't hurt them. If it doesn't harm them mentally, psychologically, physically, I'm down for it. So get binders. I've got a million binders. This is my son's binder. So this one is like his medical binder. So everything, just one of. So um, because there's going to be a lot of paperwork, even if your general paperwork, say that your child's typical developing and you want to keep track of certain like... um, like, uh, assessments that you're, that the teacher gives you. And I know a lot of everything is digital now, but I promise you having it in your hand yesterday, when I went to that, that, uh, that new school, um, program that I, I want my son to go to, um, I took his latest IEP and they were like, Oh my gosh, thank you so much. And I usually always go to the doctors with uh, a list of like, concerns. I usually like, um, I, I had to start doing this because with my ADD newsflash, I have ADD, um, that I would lose track of like what I really needed to ask the doctor or, you know, what, you know, whatever. So I would start typing out like latest medications, um, latest symptoms, because that too, will will kind of help you, uh, my son has PANS, PANDAS. It's an acronym. What it is, is uh, it's like OCD and he has flares. A lot of people go misdiagnosed and a lot of times it looks like someone's being um, like um, unruly. They're being um, uh, aggressive and they're mean when there's an underlining and some people get it from strep. So 
you could be, you and I could be just living our lives. We have a bad case of strep and we have like this condition now that um, inflames our brain. It inflames, you know, your body. And so usually when my son has a flare, um, he has to have like ibuprofen on a regular basis, diflucan, which is an antifungal. But you look at things like um, when you look back at your doctor's notes that like you you give to your doctor and he sees like a world renowned doctor, like people come to see this one doctor that he's been going to for years and he would love that I came with notes. The whole the whole office, oh, we hear about you. You're the mom that comes with notes because parents are so not prepared. I did it not to be a nerd. I did it because I need to do that to process things and to make sure I don't overlook things. And But I also, it helps because he can, doctors nowadays, they're not, they can't remember your health history. They don't remember you kind of have to tell your doctor what's wrong with you and like, oh yeah, it's only gotten worse. So in terms of children, if you kind of lay it out, like they had five ear infections last month and you can kind of put it like they had an ear infection. They were on antibiotics on this day. They were on antibiotics on that day. That's a lot of antibiotics. Maybe something's going on. Maybe they need to have their ears checked. They need to go see an ENT. They may need tubes. They may need their, um, you know, whatever. Uh, if they have a lot of strep issues, a lot of sore throats, things like that, maybe they need to have their adenoids and tonsils removed. Things like that, that you don't really look at. But if you write it down and you're like, you you can show it to the doctor and, and the doctor's like, wait a minute, were they? Because now practices have multiple doctors that see your kids. So your, your kid might see one doctor and per, they prescribe them something and not realize that the following doctor has also prescribed them. So like one time I had a doctor say, I can't believe how many times she's been on an antibiotic. I said, yeah, that's why I brought it to your attention because you have to be your child's advocate your their voice so he's got an educational binder uh that's the medical binder now this is one of many this is his um his iep progress reports and behavioral plans so every iep that he has had and this is not all of them because i have another binder that i have but ever since he was three every kind of assessment bye and report card, everything that I think that would be of use because I started getting messages from parents saying, oh, I wish I had the time to do what you're doing. Keep up the good work. And I'm like, dude. Oh, yeah. But in terms of like advocating and like bringing things, going to school board meetings, but even like that, I'm like, well, do you have your child's IEP? Uh, oh, I don't know what I did with it. First of all, they should be in a binder altogether. So you have them. Second of all, if they're doing it in school, you should kind of be doing it at home as well. You're supposed to be strengthening the skills that are being, you know, taught at school, especially when it comes to an IEP because they're specific goals. It's not just like academics. It's more like, you know, it's, it's life skills. It's things like that. Like, you know, tying shoes or, you know, buttoning all of that zippers, things like that. So a lot of parents just send their kids to school thoughts and prayers. I hope you have a great day. They're not, they're not reinforcing anything at home. So I was trying to do everything I could that I, that I could until I couldn't. So I think at this time, now looking back, I, I had cancer at that time. They were going to, he was going to school. He was also going to private therapies. Cause I'm like, my husband kept saying, you're always like, so, um, always doing something. You're always making sure you're doing this, uh, calm down, not calm down, but like relax. Like I was always in like that teacher mode and we have to do this. We have to do that. And he's like, just just chill. He didn't realize until just recently, because he said, um, 
last year was rough for my son because newsflash when autistic children go through puberty it's like they regress all over again they you're dealing with like i always say you know you're 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 taking three steps forward but a regression uh, a behavior can pop up out of nowhere and you're back to kind of like the starting point again with certain things. So he said, cause he was home more cause he switched jobs. He works from home now. Uh, but he's like, it's going to be too late. It, it's already, it, we're, it's gone. Like we've all this time is wasted. It's like too late and not blaming me realizing that he sees the deficits and where, you know, we're not getting the, what he, what he should be receiving. We had hurricane, we had hurricane Michael, and then we had the pandemic. So before we had the pandemic, we had a really bad hurricane. So services, a lot of uh, providers in terms of uh, doctors, specialists, uh, ABA, physical therapists, and anyone, and we didn't even have a lot of them here. So what we did have wasn't even enough at that time. He's been sitting on a wait list to get back into his ABA, um, company that he was with, uh, for over a year now, he's been on a wait list and that's like that everywhere. My husband saw, um, he came running in, he goes, Hey, I just saw on the news that FSU is doing something about ABA therapy. And I was like, okay. And I didn't want to be like that pessimistic person. And I'm like, it's autism awareness month. They're having their fundraiser. Of course they're going to They're going to like, oh, look, we have ABA therapy and FSU does this. When I called and inquired about that, they're like, oh, it's anywhere from an eight month to like a a year and a half wait list. And even at that point, we don't know how many hours a child can get. So if there are services, Autism Speaks, all these different organizations, it's, dude. We shouldn't, when you said, why is it we're still so far behind? Why is there still a stigma? Why, why haven't we gotten our shit together as a whole? It's because the monies that are being raised and it's not being utilized. It's not being promoted to where it should be. Like we should be promoting, um, professionals in OT and PT. Um, every child that has autism will benefit from occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech language. So, and if, if those services are, are subpar, like, so you have to take what you can get. And I'm not down with that. Like I'm, that's not me. That's a lot of parents, but that's not me. And I'm one of very few parents that make sure that their children go to specific schools. Like I said, they don't have to be at the schools that they're at. They want to be there. I want them to be there. So, but yeah, I, I, uh, looking back, I, I hate the government. I don't think I've ever really loved the government, but going back to like, say, going back to like 18 year old Shannon, back in the in like 95 and uh we're seeing you know all of these things lead up to like 911 and I was in a classroom with children and I remember when that happened and not really getting the whole story cuz you're getting bits and pieces of what's going on and I'm looking at these children these teeny tiny smiling happy children while the world is literally like will no longer be the way that it was. And I had parents coming to pick up their children. I had grown men crying because they just needed to come get their kids. And I'm like, I get it. And they're like, well, how are you not crying? And I'm like, cause we, we have to be strong for the kids because children are going to like match your energy. They're going to be like, what, what's going on with my mom? Why is she like freaking out? So, but yeah, what I realized that I would give my life for any child that day. I realized I was like, cause you start to realize because like 
you start, you know, you know where all the exits are of a school. We had um, a patio, so we had sliding glass doors, so there was more of an, uh, of you know, of a way that someone could get in. But you know, you know, you we had safety protocols. But that day, I realized I was like, okay, if anyone were to ever come this way, like you have like all of these plans, you shouldn't have to. But this is the world we live in. So that was like a real big eye opener. I love my country. Don't get me wrong. I hate the government. And the government is the reason why we see the issues that we we see. We see the wars. And my daughter, I she was like, mommy, they're, they're burning the flag and that's against the law. And I was like, and I hear Wilkins say, yeah, you tell her. And I'm like, I was helping my son and I get out of the bathroom with him. And I'm like, I thought it was like, an American burning a flag. So I said to her, it's not against the law, even though like you may not burn the flag, I would not burn the flag. We don't, we don't agree that that flag should be burned. It's their right. It, and we go, we, it was a teachable moment. So, uh, my husband's like, no. And I'm like, uh, yeah. So, I realized that he had the nightly news on, which we have a no, she can watch, my daughter likes to watch the local news, mostly because of the meteorologist. But so I, I tell her, I don't want you watching the news. As soon as like the whole Israel thing, I'm like, nope, we're not, because it's, they just loop all the, the negative and all the scary stuff. Go to bed. Do you need a cord? No, I accidentally broke it. Oh, Lana. It was an accident. See, right there. Look, right there. Hi, guys. It's Autism Awareness. Look, in that bin right there. Look, that bin right there. Lana, right there. No, there's a cord right there. Go ahead. There. Yes. Take your dog with you. Close my door. Love you. It's past your bedtime. You have a field trip tomorrow morning. Uh, misconceptions. You can have it all. Going back to like what I was saying, it's amazing how I may have had learning disabilities, you know, as a child and school didn't, wasn't easy to me, for me. And I did much better in college and stuff but that was because I was interested in what I was studying. But knowing back then, not too many uh, females, ladies that want to be moms are like, oh, um, I'm going to be a a stay-at-home mom and not have a career. Not too many parents, moms see like the – the importance of just being a stay at home mom or just being a mom. I'm not knocking working moms. I was a working mom. Um, but in terms of careers, you can't have it all. I remember hearing one year saying like, for a lot of people, you have like seasons of in your life. And it's true. Like, and after I stopped working and I was pregnant with my son, I was high risk. I had, I, uh, lost so many pregnancies. I had a lot of miscarriages. So, um, I really, I really wanted that. I really wanted to be a mom. I knew I was going to be a mom and I'm thinking how ironic would it be that I'm so good with children, but yet I'm never going to have my own children. Like that was like always in my head. And the pressures that we have as women, because, you know, you have to get married and you're supposed to have children and, and when you have, like, I remember when I had a miscarriage, it, it felt like there was a stigma, like you, you know, a lot of people are starting to talk about it more, but at that time I was very private about it and only my family and, and like close friends, but you realize because you feel shame and you have all of these expectations of what motherhood should be like. And then it, it's not what anything that you're thinking about, like it's, And I kind of blame like cultural, like, you know, you know, like culture, like, you know, movies and how it should be. And 
it's not real. Like you're not, you're not going to know what you're doing in, in motherhood, like all the time. And you're, you're going to feel like, like I just said to my husband, I feel like I'm screwing up my kids. And it's like, I know that kids always like they grow up and they feel like, Oh, um, not so much my parents, but like, you know, you hear like, Oh, my parents were horrible. They, they messed me up. They did this. And I feel like that's a typical thing. I feel like, you know, you kind of like, if you know that your parents parented a certain way, you might kind of like, I'm very similar with how I parent, like how my mom, but I tweaked a little bit. I'm a little bit more laxed. My eight-year-old might say shit. It is what it is. Um, she knows she can't say it at school, but like things like that. But um, the career thing, like I feel bad for, and, and I, and I'm happy that my husband is like, he's starting to realize things like, um, you don't have to push your, your kids to be, you know, you have to go to college, you have to go to university, you have to be a doctor. I'm sure in your culture, like primarily doctors, nurses, like engineers. Exactly. And that's typical with like, but you know, there, we have like those stereo, you know, there's stereotypes like, right. So, um, but we would not be doing her a service by saying, you need to go to university. You need to go, to, you need to go to Harvard. You need to be this. You need, you need to be a, like a neurosurgeon. You need to be an accountant. And a lot of parents kind of put that on their children when, you know, you need to do this. You need to go through school. You need to go to college when maybe that's not their path. Yes. Get, get to high school, then do a vote, you know, like a vote, like a technical training, um, something. So the other day he tells me that when they were driving home, she announced that now she's eight, she's not going to school. She's not going to go to college. She wants to grow up and she wants to work at McDonald's. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and he's like, um, I was like, okay, well, what did you tell her? Cause she's, she's looking at me. Cause I'm trying not, I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to like, look at him. Like, what did you do? You didn't like crush her little hopes and dreams of working at McDonald's. Did you? Because come on, that's like when you're little and you want to be an astronaut, you want to be a, a truck driver, you want to be, you know, like, come on, a teacher, whatever. So, you know, your interests are going to change and stuff, but you're not going to don't crush your, your kids dreams and don't, press on them that they have to be something that, you know, they don't want to be because you're, you're kind of like brainwashing them. If you think about it, if you have those parents that are like, you have to go into the medical field, you have to go into this, you have to do that. You have to go into the family law business. Like, so you're learning, you live with, I always say this, you learn what you live and you live what you learn. So an abusive home is normal to those children because that's normal to them. Is it normal to us? No, because you know, if you're not from that. So if you have a parent that's constantly saying you need to play sports, you need to be a baseball player. You need to be a football player. You need to be a gymnast. Like I get so upset with these parents because they act like, you know, they're playing T-ball yelling at these kids. Like if they're going to, you know, be, professional players. So, um, I, I know that everyone wants to be their very best and they have their interest and yeah, you may want to be a lawyer. Um, could I go into what I originally wanted to do? Eventually I might be too late because like I'm older, like I, you know, with all the miscarriages, like it, we just, it, I'm an older mom. I've got to, primarily younger kids, but a lot of moms go to school and then they realize they go to university, they have those, uh, the careers and, uh, that they're, you know, they're in their office more than their home. And then, you know, because their dads are like, you have to be able to provide for yourself. You have to don't rely on a man. And I get that. I get that. But there has to be some kind of a balance. And I didn't get that from my parents. I didn't get the, don't do this. You have to do that. You know? Yeah. You know, stand up for yourself. 
but why are you going to like put yourself in all this debt? Because what happens is these girls are going to school, they're graduating, they're going to university, they may go into, if they're, they're a doctor, they're extended. So they're in their thirties and they're realizing, I want to have, I want to have a kid. I want to be a mom. And, um, but they spent their whole life primarily focused on a career and then, but they think you can have it all, which again, government, that's the whole woke. That was the whole, like, you can have it all. You know, that's why, you know, daycare was implemented. Baby should not be in daycare. Daycare was, uh, implemented as like last resort. If you, there was a, a, a mom, a single mom that needed that, you know, that assistance, but it was very lucrative that it was turned into a business model. So like autism speaks and like with everything else, it's a grift and then you're doing more harm than good for a child. And I'm not saying that preschool is bad, but babies in a daycare center, their whole, the whole day is, is stunting their, their overall development. So motherhood misconceptions, you can have it all. You can't have it all. Uh, uh, you may think that you're going to have a child that, you know, likes to do this and likes to do that. Uh, I guess the biggest one, no one ever thinks that when they're pregnant, they're going to have a child with a disability. You think about all the cute things and all the fun things and everything that you're going to get to do with that child, that baby, that child, and all the family trips that you're going to do and the traditions that you're going to, to make with them. And then, you know, you may be a mom that didn't have those screenings and you don't realize until you're giving birth that your child has a major deformity or, you know, a major disability. And your whole world is like, you realize quickly, everything flashes in front of your eyes. I was fortunate that they're healthy children. I am very, I know that there's more positives than negatives. I just want my children to be happy, productive, to, to be valued. And children like my son are not valued. That's why when I said in that one interview, our children are treated like second class citizens that threw, you know, everyone into a tizzy because they're sitting in a, in a rundown school and you have high schools that have auditoriums and theater stages. And like, seriously, I mean, it's not okay. So yeah, misconceptions. Did I answer that question? Misconceptions of motherhood. I mean, look, what, how did, how do I put it? I've never overly been, um, what's the word? Um, I'm not pessimistic, but I'm, I'm never, I've never been like one of those optimists. Like I'm, I'm so optimistic. I am like, you know, that was my internal, like how I dealt with things. Now I'm trying to do better in terms of like giving my, like when I gave my daughter at the age of three, cause she would, she would sit there and just cry and she would be in the car and she'd get so upset and she would just be like, I don't know what's wrong. I don't. And I'm like, okay. And I was trying to tiptoe around autism with her. And then I was like, you know what? I'm not doing any good. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to shield her from something that she shouldn't be ashamed of it. It's just a part of her. It's not all of her, but we just, there's ways that we can find ways to help her, you know, get through the things that she's going through. And a lot of it was the anxiety part of it. So even that, even if it wasn't the autism, you have to, let your children know it's okay that they're feeling the way that they're feeling. Like, I see that you're upset. I, you look really frustrated. Like give them those words. You're angry. What can I do to help you? What can we do to calm you down? And so when you start to get that open communication, that dialogue, you're going to see that you're not 
it's going to be so much easier. Disability, no disability, like even, even a typical kid, it's not easy being a mom. Like it's not easy being a parent. Like it's hard. And, you know, especially when they get older and they get their little personalities and they're trying to stick up for themselves and their interests change and they're not listening to you as much and you do have to kind of negotiate. And, but that's what they need. Whereas when I was a kid, there wasn't a lot of negotiating. It was what you were told, right? So, but that didn't, uh, children are to be seen and not heard. That was, that was a saying back in the day, like, don't mouth off, don't talk back. And so I'll say to my daughter, you're being a little sassy. I don't like the way that you're responding to me. I know that I, I understand you. My one friend said that I give her too many opportunities to, um, choices. I give her too many choices. I go, I know, man, I know, but it's just my philosophy. And I feel like I know that it sucks right now. But in the end, like when she, when we're negotiating, they're going to negotiate for the rest of their lives. They're going to negotiate in business. They're going to negotiate everywhere they go. Like they need to have that, you know, that open dialogue with people. So I would explain to her, I remember the first time I said, I gave her the word anxiety and I was like, fuck, I gotta, Okay. I was like, look, I'm like, you have anxiety. You get anxious and this is how, and I explained what anxiety is and all the different ways that you can feel anxious and the way that it may look and it it's different for everyone. There's different levels and it might be excitement and, you know, mixed in and that's her thing. She gets so excited. That's why she's still up because she's got a field trip tomorrow. She prepared already this morning. She got everything ready for tomorrow and she's all excited. So she can't shut her brain off, you know? So, and it's also because she knows I'm on with you and she's like, you know, it's fine. She'll get up. I'll be there with a pot and pan in the morning. Let's go. Wake up. Wake up. You should have been asleep last night. No. But so um, I explained to her and, I, and then it rolled into autism. So I would say to her, look, you have autism. You are autistic is how I remember saying it to her. And I'm like, and it's not. I said, I I most likely have autism. I'm autistic. Your dad, for sure. Like he realized after a couple of years into this whole autism, he's like, I think I'm autistic. No shit. I told you that. But anyway, but um, so I explained to her, it's just, it is what it is. It's just, just who you are and you are amazing. You are the funniest even then I knew she was going to be hilarious like she is just a funny kid and I know everyone thinks that of their kid but I know I know my children's you know you know I know I know the good and the bad so I I would tell her you know it's just we need to find ways to cope and to um to soothe and to just calm down your calming techniques so I lost my shit and when I say I lost my shit I it's n it wasn't bad, but she saw that I got so worked up and it had to do with something with the, whatever, the school district. And I was just having a conversation with my husband and I was getting animated and she could see. And like I said, kids can see that, right? And when they're used to you just being, you know, one way, she went on her, um, her iPad and she found adult calming techniques and she printed it out for me. She's eight. She's eight. I don't know if I would be here today if I were to have printed off my mom calming techniques. <laughs> and everything like, like, they break the laws all those, all the time. Like, you know, she goes and tattles. She tells my mom, uh, she tells on me all the time and she'll say your daughter, meaning me. And she'll say, I told your mom. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. And then, so she gets me in trouble all the time. But if I were to have done that to my mom, if I would have said anything to my grandma or whatever, she would have not been very happy. So there's a lot of things like motherhood, just, you know what? Prepare what is it? Hope for the best, Pre prepare for the worst, hope for the best, whatever that is. Just 
take it a day at a time. And I used to plan so far in advance and autism, you realize that your day can go to shit. Like the first time I had to cancel with you because of autism, something to, to do with that. So, and you were very understanding, but, um, but yeah, like I can't tell you like when I have to like, um, my scans and all that, my cancer screenings and stuff, my CT scans, it's always like six months out. And I'm like, sure, let's go. We'll try to plan that. And then like, chances are I end up having to cancel it. And I, I can't see that far ahead. I'm, I'm a day, that whole day by day saying, I, I totally get that because you can't, you know, just go with the flow, do the best that you can And even just as a regular mom, a regular dad, like just let your kids explore, let them get messy. You know, yes, the house is going to be a mess. My, my husband's come a long way because his OCD used to be really bad, but he, he has come a long way. And yesterday I was kind of hanging out with my son because he was like, you know, we're touring this new place and he was loving it. They had horses. There was, um, uh, goats and chickens and all of it. It's amazing. So, uh, he was actually talking with the lady that was touring us more than I would have. I, he would have like, he would say, this is your area. Like when he was in denial about, you know, both of them, I remember the first time he's like, look, you know, we'll do whatever you think we need to do. If you think he needs, this is your area. And I, and I said, you know, I advocated for so many children. I have to advocate for my child. Even if I'm second guessing myself, I always feel like, you know, even if you think you write it down and you're like, oh, maybe I'm being like, you know, like everyone used to make fun of me if I took my kid, if I took him to the doctor And, um, they're like, oh, you're being, you know, you're just, you know, you're being silly. You're just being overprotective or or whatever. I'd rather take him and know that he's okay and look silly than there was an underlining problem and, and do that. Like if you feel like, you know, your child's sick or needs to go to see a doctor or a specialist and say, you think your, your child needs to see a specialist and your doc and that doctor says no, cause usually you need a referral. Like we don't need a referral, but a lot of people, because of the system, they need referrals. You can go and get a second opinion. And I would press you, you know, a lot of times it's like, you're not co-parenting with the government. You're not co-parenting with doctors. These are not their children. So they should not have the right or say of, of how you raise your children. So if you feel like we're seeing now, you have to be really careful because we're seeing a lot of cases that rights are being taken away of parents. Children are being taken away. Spike Cohen has been highlighting a lot of that. There's a case in Georgia, uh, a lot in California, and not primarily probably because the state's so large, but also because it's commie, but like, because, uh, a parent missed a specific doctor appointment, they saw the state saw fit to take, uh, their children away. And so you need to look at that. And I, and I guess that's why I was kind of like trying to be like that advocate in the sense that, Hey, we need to do this. Here are my concerns to where I went from zero to a hundred. Like I'm at a hundred because I'm no longer in fear. I'm not going to be in fear that like my child's not going to be able to go to the school that, you know, that he likes to go to. Because I said that to the superintendent, the school superintendent that, you know, when we go out into, you know, the community, we go into stores, we still get people looking at us. You know, you still get people looking at it. I don't care anymore. I'll stare back. Like, like when, when that first transpired, that one incident, when he was younger, that hit hard. But from that point on, I'm like, okay, well, we're just going to have to, and see a lot of parents don't go out. They stay home. They don't let their kids because embarrassment, um, the inclusion factor, uh, accessible, like, is it accessible? Like, how are they going to do like, oh, what if they like cause a scene? 
cause all the scenes. That's how we all learn. All of us have caused some kind of scene. Like we've all like had, you know, we've all been opinionated. It just looks different. But if you don't take those trips to the grocery store, if you don't go out to the restaurant, how do you expect them to do that when they're adults? They're not going to be little forever. They need these skills and they need them now. But like when my husband said, yeah, could, could you imagine? And there's so many, there's so many, um, adults with disabilities that once they age out of the program, like, so you know how like, uh, you can go to school till you're 18, you graduate at 18 for special education. It's, uh, I'm pretty sure it's like this throughout the like 21 and 22. I want to say the age they can. So my son can be, yeah. And you know, and that's because technically like they need more, um, they just need more time, but it's not helping them if it's not, if it's not quality, like if they're not learning the different ways that they can learn and they're like, this is the way you have, we're not, we don't all fit in a box. Like I am horrible at trying to like, just do something like my husband will text me, Hey, I'm thinking about, uh, uh, we're having a deck built and he's like, it's going to be this, this, this dimension. And I'm like, look, you know, by now we should, are, are you new here? I need to see a picture. I need to see something. You can't tell me numbers and like you're using, it's not going to happen friend. Like you, you know better. And so, because he, you know, you, it, you know, some people have that mind where give those dimensions and Look, I'm the one that when I'm Amazon shopping, I need a a sensory, I needed a, a a therapy bouncy ball that was like a regular like medicine, like whatever those balls are called. I ended up with one. I'll send you a picture. This thing was huge. My my brother filled it up for me. It was during Christmas and it was for my son. I'm like, hey, it's on my bed. Can you go pump it up? He goes, Can you come here for a second? And I was like, Yeah. And I thought maybe he popped it. He goes, what is this? And I was like, oh my God, it's not supposed to be that big. <laughs> he was so amazing with this ball. He did the, the, the craziest tricks with this ball. He would bounce off of it, jump up on the table, go back on this. It was amazing what this boy could do with this ball, but it was not supposed to be that big. So I'm really bad when it comes to like, like I, I would try to order like my, my shampoo and conditioner and I'm here thinking I'm getting a specific bottle and no lie. One day, like the little trial size came in and I'm like, come on, Shannon. But this is why I need to go into a store. I need to look at things and that's just me. And, and it's also cause I don't pay attention and whatever, but yeah, I mean, just do what, do something and if you feel like you're failing, I feel like I fail a million times in a day. But when you when you hear your kid say something like, and it could be the littlest compliment that you would be like, that's random, or like you wouldn't think that it would be important. Like uh, I made pizza, I made homemade pizza, and um, my dog, sure. Oh God. Yeah. Let's wrap up. Wrap it up. I think we covered it all primarily, you know, just be your child's voice, be that person, be that thorn in someone's side, because no one's going to advocate for your child the way you're going to. No one's going to care for your child the way you're going to. I mean, I may, but there's not too many of me out there. So like, and you see how everyone's getting together. We see like the COVID, like it didn't work because everyone was like, this, this is not going to fly. That needs to happen. Like parents need to come together and everyone just Whatever the case may be, whatever your 
causes, whatever your concern is, you need to find those groups. And Facebook is good for that. And, you know, if you have groups like, uh, yeah, like networking, so homeschool groups, I would say that if you, you could homeschool your child, you should homeschool your children. I, I'm going to pull my daughter out after fifth grade. She's not going to middle school because I'm sorry, but middle school, public middle school, I, I don't know. Nope, 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 nope. So, but private school, if your child, uh, there are scholarships out there, if your child does have a disability, or even if they don't, look into scholarships, and they're all over the country, all over our country, and you can um, use that to put your child in a private school. Or, you know, and you don't have to you don't have to have your child go to school all day long. And I know that some parents are like, but I need the break. And you know what? Yes, it may be easy now, but you're just going to make it harder on everyone when they're older because you have not done everything that you possibly can to prepare them for life. So, and I, I shouldn't be here today. I shouldn't be this vocal. I should probably just be some like super introverted person with very little social skills, with very minimal communication skills. Um, But because my mom pushed me and did what she had to do and my dad did what he had to do for us, like, and my, and I'm seeing that with my husband. So dads need to do the same thing. It took him a little long, you know, cause he was like, this is your thing. But he, I was listening to him talk with the lady yesterday and I, we got back to the car and I'm like, look at you advocating for your son. I said, I heard what you were saying and the questions, ask questions. Don't feel like if you feel stupid, I feel stupid all the time. Hi, I'm sure you're new here if you don't know me, but I feel stupid all the time, but you need to do it. You have to push yourself to do these things. So I had to, I was sitting on a call. I had to be on a, um, it was a federal program for the school district and they wanted me to represent um, my son's school. I was supposed to go to the district and have this conversation and I didn't. I did it by Zoom. No one was asking hard questions and everyone was just, you know, there was a room full of people. There was a shit ton of people on the call and no one's asking where all this money is going. And I was triggered because I want you all to know that um, our borders should not be open. We should not be letting everybody in. I'm sorry. I know I'm a bad libertarian for thinking that, but going through the trials that I'm going through and, and seeing the lack of resources and the professionals for my children, it's got to stop and it's not going to get any better. So it's your children that are being sent off to fight wars. It's your children that are going without. It's your children that are homeless. It's not. So they said on this call that there was a allotted amount of money, allotted money for, um, uh, immigrants coming from Ukraine. They said Ukraine. And I was like, okay. I was like, oh no. And then, so when they said that, I thought that was going to be the worst of it. Then they said that they're primarily moving, uh, to Panama city beach. If I'm not living on Panama city beach, these people who are coming from another country should not be, it's very expensive to live on the beach. And so our money is, so they're not being just housed in like a, uh, like a moderate or like a, whatever that word is, like a, I don't know, what's that word when it's like, it's not too fancy, but it, I don't know what that word is. I'll figure it out. That makes two of us. But so they're, they're being housed and given all of these assistances. So services are being taken away from not just my kids, but your kids too. So for all of you who are on that side that our borders should be open and we should let everyone come in until we can kind of get everyone up to speed and there's enough services and money and opportunities for our own citizens, our children. So 
you have to realize that you need to look at that and you need to be aware that you're going to have to speak up and be like, you know, yes, vote. And I, and I know that a lot of people don't like to vote. I don't like to vote, but you know, don't vote just because you're one specific party. You need to get into your local government. I don't care about federal government. But no one can tell me if I asked you who your city council members are, would you know all of them? You should. So, but that's like, that was me. That was me up until just not too long ago, like the pandemic. So when you realize who is supposed to be representing you and how they're aligning with certain people and certain like, you know, whatever, lobbyists and all that. Local is so important. Sheriff's office is the most important. So the president, obviously, we can see that it's not that important who is the president. Sheriffs, in a case of an emergency, they have the right to lock you down or to say, you're not locking my county down. And a lot of people don't realize that. So just please be more aware of local your local politics. No one likes politics. I hate it. I thought I was moving from Miami up here to like live a quiet country life with the beach nearby. No, I'm now all over the news and all over. I don't want to be this way. I just, it didn't have to be this way. This is why we can't have nice things. I'm on the Twitters, um, Cruel Spark, uh, and I think that's it. YouTube. I have a YouTube channel, but I, it's, I protested, put that up, but it's really not active, but you can find me on, on Twitter, on X. That's it. Thank you so much for having me on.